Let me uh, turn it over to Jonalyn to start with her uh, exciting presentation on cockroaches. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be with you all on this Friday morning. And let's hop into cockroaches. So today we'll talk a little bit about just basic biology and habits of cockroaches. We'll move into more specifically the health impacts of cockroaches and then break cockroaches down into peridomestic and domestic species and then look at what control looks like for both of them. So jumping now into cockroach biology, cockroaches are absolutely built to survive. They have many traits that make them good at not only surviving but thriving in a variety of environments including around and inside human structures. So in this first section, we'll go through some of these traits, but I'd like you to be thinking about how can we take these traits and our knowledge of these behaviors and use them to be more effective in our control. So cockroaches are certainly built to play defense. They have this hardened exoskeleton that's comprised of chitin that protects those squishy, more fragile components inside. They also have this pronotum structure that protects the back of their head and neck, as this is a very sensitive and critical area. All cockroaches go under three stages of life. They start out with eggs, move into it nymphs and adults. We refer to this as an incomplete metamorphosis because the nymphs look very similar to the adults. Typically, the cockroach lifespan depends on the species as well as environmental conditions that they're exposed to. So things like temperature, moisture, and food availability. Having an understanding of the cockroach life cycle can be very helpful for catching infestations before that they grow into serious problems. So within the life cycle, they start out as eggs, which are typically laid inside of egg cases called oothiki. These eggs hatch into nymphs. And then as those nymphs move through each of their life stages, they molt. They shed their exoskeleton in order to grow a little bit bigger each time. The number of molts can be variable depending on the species and, again, as well as depending on those environmental conditions. So after the final molt, nymphs will enter the adult stage and begin to reproduce, at which point the life cycle begins all over again. So because many species can go through these life cycles very quickly, they can have this very quick population time turnaround. So even if individuals are getting killed off by a treatment, they're going to be replaced very quickly by not only one, but many other individuals. Again, this depends a little bit on the species, but in the case of German cockroaches, which are an indoor species, we'll talk more about them when we get to that domestic roach section, each egg case contains about 40 eggs. Each of those can go from egg to adult in about 100 days. And so we can see these really massive growths in cockroach numbers in a relatively small amount of time. So, Many of these species, again, particularly German cockroaches, are going to form these large aggregations. Uh, they're not social in the sense that we think of with ants, bees, or termites, but they certainly have this semi-social aspect. These aggregations, these gatherings, are regulated by their gut bacteria and these pheromones or smells that are present in the feces. And these pheromones indicate that that's a safe place to hunker down and hide out when the roaches are not out foraging. These aggregations are also very important for growth and development. So German cockroach nymphal development is greatly affected by social interactions, and particularly the younger instars, the ones that have just hatched out of those eggs, are going to be very highly aggregative. The physical contact with other German cockroaches has actually been found to accelerate nymphal development. So they're going to grow quicker. And those, excuse me, those aggregations can also facilitate things like thermal regulation and reducing water loss. So helping those younger cockroaches to survive. Additionally, reproductive maturity, that ability to make more cockroaches has been found to be accelerated by being in these aggregations. So cockroaches are typically active at night by staying hidden away during the day when predators presumably would be out. 
this helps them to sur survive, thrive, and continue to go on and reproduce. That being said, with the right environment where you have lots of harborage, lots of places to hide, abundant food and water, we can create a roach paradise of sorts where they will happily be out and foraging during the day. In particular, in this image, there is a lot of clutter that's allowing cockroaches to move around without necessarily being exposed to the air and to the light. So this has them out and about during the daytime very readily. Cockroaches are omnivorous and they can eat and survive on just about anything edible. So food left out, crumbs on dirty dishes, uh, pet food, it's all fair game and helps them to survive, grow and reproduce. Even though they aren't picky eaters, they also don't have to eat very often. And we typically say that cockroaches can go about a month without feeding, just depending on the environmental conditions. More so than starvation, cockroaches are most susceptible to dehydration. So generally, it's only about a week that cockroaches can go before they're going to have um, some problems with not having access to water. And for this reason, they're typically found associated with wetter areas outside and inside the home. So inside the home areas with like leaking pipes, um, in kitchens or around bathrooms. Speaking of eating almost everything, young cockroach nymphs will practice coprophagy. So this is the consuming of the feces of other cockroaches. This provides benefits to those nymphs, but it also facilitates the spread of pathogens and disease. So if you've ever uncovered a cockroach during the daytime, maybe by moving a fridge or an appliance, that cockroach is going to run and it's going to run very fast. So they have these incredibly fast relay systems that allow them to dart quickly in response to light or motion at speeds of up to 50 body lengths per second. If we scale that up to human size, that's the equivalent of running a couple of hundred miles per hour. So this makes them incredibly good at escaping predators. Cockroaches also have structures on each of their legs that makes them better at running, climbing, and escaping. So on their tarsi, which is that last segment of each leg, cockroaches have these claws that they use to hook on and help them grip better, especially when they're running up vertical surfaces. They also have this structure called an aeroleum that kind of acts like a suction cup, helping them to climb those vertical surfaces as well. These structures differ based on species. Some species have a more developed aeroleum, some have hardly an aeroleum at all. And what this translates into is different abilities to climb based on the species and therefore different places where they might be found in the home. So jumping now into health impacts and because of their ability to swell to such high populations in the home, they have that quick population turnaround time, as well as their introduction of allergens into the home, which we'll talk more about at the end of this section, cockroaches are the most medically relevant indoor pests. There is a tremendous amount of social stigma associated with having pests but especially cockroaches in one's home. And the stress associated with having cockroaches in the home and dealing with them in your space, finding them in your food, finding them in your belongings can lead to adverse psychological impacts. In extreme cases, this can lead to things like delusory parasitosis, where individuals believe that their person or their home is infested by insects that aren't truly there. This is a very difficult situation for all parties involved, and here I want to highlight that since we aren't medical professionals and we can't treat unless we identify an insect or arthropod pest, in such cases, sometimes the best you can do is show compassion, but also recognizing when it might be best to walk away. Another thing we think of when it comes to cockroaches and human health are their ability to mechanically transfer pathogens and disease-causing agents. 
especially our peri-domestic species like American cockroaches, they're associated with refuse. They might be climbing in through pipes and sewers. Those have a lot of very nasty things in them. And so as they're coming in contact with this, they might be bringing that into the home. The movement of cockroaches between waste and food contributes to their potential to pick up, carry, and then spread a wide variety of pathogenic bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and viruses, either on their the outside of their body or in their digestive system. There have been over 100 potentially pathogenic organisms that have been isolated from cockroaches collected in and around human and animal environments, including farms, zoos, uh, aviaries, and kennels. Notably, there have not been studies that show a clear relationship between cockroaches and infectious diseases in the real world. However, due to that association of cockroaches with these disease-causing agents and the role that we've demonstrated in food contamination, it's not unlikely that they are driving the transmission of, the, of these diseases to humans. And finally, cockroach allergens. Cockroaches produce a series of potent allergens, and the exposure to these allergens can trigger allergic reactions and asthma symptoms, especially in, in children, and especially in children growing up in homes with high cockroach populations. There have been around 12 allergens that have been officially recognized and named from the German cockroach and about the same from the American cockroach. These relate to a variety of biological and physiological processes within the insect. So the two I have here in renderings, uh, Blodgy 1, Blodgy 2, they're named after the German cockroach. These are gut proteins. So they're associated with the digestive tract and they shed in the feces. If a roach is in the home, it's defecating. And there's this constant introduction of these particular allergens into the home as a result. Some other allergens are related to reproduction, to detoxification, which could have um, implications for if you have resistant populations or if roaches are getting potentially sublethal doses of an active ingredient. And cockroach allergens can be derived from the muscles, um, be associated with metabolism, as well as chitin, that important component of the insect's exoskeleton. So the link between cockroaches and cockroach allergens and the development of an exacerbation of asthma was made in the 1960s. And since then, many studies have examined and confirmed an association between high levels of exposure to cockroaches and subsequent sensitization to cockroach allergens with asthma morbidity, which are the consequences and complications that can result from a disease not including death. Asthma morbidities can include things like difficulty breathing, but also missed school days, nights without sleep, unscheduled medical visits, and hospitalizations for asthma, which have both direct financial costs as well as indirect financial costs, such as missed work days for parents that are having to take care of a sick child. A study also found that children who are both allergic to asthma and exposed to high levels of cockroach allergens had three times as many hospitalizations compared to other children per year. In the US, the prevalence of cockroach allergy has been estimated to range from 17 to 41% in both children and adults. So it affects a pretty substantial part of our population. And here I'd like to highlight the, this study, which was done by the American Thoracic Society that examined the economic burden of asthma. Now this was asthma as a whole, so it wasn't specific to cockroaches, but they estimated that 15.4 million people in the US had been treated for asthma each year. And that total annual cost related to asthma was about $82 billion. Again, this study was not specifically cockroach related, 
but it definitely establishes the economic burden that's associated with cockroach-related asthma morbidities. So population control of German cockroaches from residences is held as the solution for cockroach allergens in the home. And if you get rid of the cockroaches, which are the source of the allergens, eventually at some point, those allergen levels are going to fall. And we've seen that in ma many studies at this point. So especially when it comes to managing cockroaches and reducing cockroach populations within the home, pest control is a true and very important public health service. And what I wanna highlight here is that the work that you're doing has direct impact on people's health and well-being. So next we're gonna jump right into our cockroach species and looking at their control, starting with peri-domestic species. But first I'd like to highlight that there are over 4,500 species of cockroaches globally. And only a very small portion of these, about 30 of them are considered pests and only a handful of those, maybe five to eight are considered serious pests. Most species occur in the tropics, so they're rarely coming in contact with humans. And a lot of them look very, very cool. But we're here to talk about the pest species. So pest cockroaches can be broken down into two groups, our peridomestic species, which live outside, and occasionally make their way indoors, but they're unable to establish inside. Conversely, domestic species are completely reliant on human-built structures. They cannot live outdoors. So first up is the Pennsylvania wood cockroach. This is a native species of cockroach. They're about an inch long. They have this dark brown coloration. And males typically have longer wings that cover the full length of their body, while females have wings that are only covering about a third to two thirds of the abdomen. Males can fly to some degree. They don't have the ability for sustained flight, but they can um, fly a little bit and often are attracted to lights. So the Pennsylvania wood cockroach has a pretty unique Oothica. So the egg case is going to be a yellowish brown. They're fairly large and they have this sort of characteristic half moon shape. The nymphs are kind of a mid to dark brown. They lack wings as all nymphs and all immatures do, but they're not very distinct. So they just kind of have this brownish color, very even brown color. Primarily, Pennsylvania wood cockroaches are going to be feeding on decaying organic matter outdoors. Usually, nymphs and adults can be found underneath loose bark or in wood piles, tree holes, stumps. They can sometimes, on, on the structure, be found under shingles or in rain gutters of homes. These are a true occasional invader. They don't typically like to come inside, but they can make their way inside on infested firewood that's being brought indoors or again, with the males being attracted to those lights, flying up onto the structure, and then making their way on inside. Typically, this is during the summer months when males are kind of going on uh, flights in order to find females to reproduce. Next up is the oriental cockroach. These are about an inch long. They have a dark brown to black color. They can sometimes be very shiny. And notably, the females lack true wings. So instead, they have these very, very reduced wings, even more so than Pennsylvania wood cockroaches. Males have wings that cover about three quarters of the body length. Both males and females, as well as nymphs, are fairly slow moving. They're kind of sluggish. And all of them are not good climbers because their aeroleum structure is not very well developed. And so typically they're found at or below ground level. Rarely can they be found up on walls or in high cupboards or on the upper floors of buildings. Females will typically deposit the egg cases in cracks or on surfaces. And the nymphs have a very similar look to the adults. They have this dark brown to black color but unlike the female oriental cockroach, which has those reduced wings, 
nymphs are not going to have any wings or wing buds. So oriental cockroaches are commonly found outdoors in decaying organic material. They really like warm, damp, shady areas. So areas like in the landscaping, inside of crawl spaces, in sewers or floor drains, in and around trash where there's going to be a lot of decaying organic material potentially, as well as indoors in areas of high moisture. Next up are Turkestan cockroaches. These are about an inch long and they have different appearances based on sex. So the females have this dark brown to black coloration, as well as these cream colored markings on their wings. Very, very reduced wings in Turkestan cockroach females. And in contrast, the males have this brownish, orange, reddish color, and they have full wings that cover the length of their body. Turkestan cockroach females can lay between two and 25 egg cases per female in her lifetime. And each of these contain about 18 eggs per egg case. So one notable quality of the species is that they can reproduce fairly quickly. Those nymphs also have a very distinct appearance. So the nymphs have a reddish brown thorax and a darker brown abdomen. So they're kind of bicolored. Turkestan cockroaches have a very similar habitat to oriental cockroaches. In some areas, particularly, I believe, the southwestern U.S., they've sort of outcompeted oriental cockroaches and become the primary pest in these environments. So outdoors, they'll be in cracks and crevices, in in-ground containers like water or irrigation boxes, hollow block walls, electrical meter boxes. Um, and typically, they're only going to be coming indoors in the summertime when the populations are getting very high. This species um, is frequently used as feeders in the reptile trade. So they're often called red roaches or red runners due to that red coloration of the nymphs. And this is due to their that very fast breeding time, as well as due to the fact that they're allegedly not very good climbers. Males are also attracted to lights. And so this can be a, a way that facilitates them entering into a structure. So to kind of distinguish between Turkestan and Oriental cockroach adult females, they look very similar. They have this dark brown, shiny appearance. And the biggest character that distinguishes them are these cream colored margins on their wings. So these little cream colored markings on both sides of the cockroach. Oriental cockroach females lack this color. They're just a flat black color all the way across. And then for nymphs, the Turkestan cockroach nymphs are going to have that bicolored appearance. So that reddish thorax and then that darker abdomen, while oriental cockroach nymphs have that uniform dark brown color all the way. Next up is the smoky brown cockroach. These have an even brown coloration. They don't have any distinctive markings, especially on their pronotum. It's just a single color. The adults are about an inch, inch and a half long. They're fairly large cockroaches. And these are primarily an outdoor pest. So more so than some of the similar looking ones that we'll talk about here in a few slides, these are a lot more prone to water loss. And so they're not able to be indoors for nearly as long or in as many environments. They really need those dark, protected, warm microhabitats. So areas like eaves that have moisture problems, um, mulch around the structure, block wall voids. Um, they can sometimes be underneath trash cans or out underneath outside pet food dishes. And when they're making their way inside, it's going to only be in areas that have accessible water. So areas with poor ventilation or moisture issues, as well as in kitchens or bathrooms, or right at points of entry, such as right next to the garage door. Smoky brown cockroaches have a fairly large egg case. It's a dark brown color. It's about an inch and a half long, so fairly large compared to some of the other species. And with their nymphs, they have different appearances based on age. 
So the younger nymphs are going to have this black coloration with white segments on the abdomen and at the base of the antennae. As they molt into older nymph instars, they develop this sort of brown, black, very solid color with no distinct markings. Next is the Australian cockroach. These are a reddish brown to a dark brown coloration, a little bit bigger than the smoky brown cockroaches, about an inch and a half, inch and a quarter in size. And typically outdoors, they're going to be found in areas of high moisture, such as associated with drains, in piles of firewood, uh, toilets, sinks, and water pipes. They primarily feed on plant material outside, and because they like these really warm, moist environments, they can oftentimes be found in greenhouses where they can be a, a pest in the sense that they damage plants. So Australian cockroach females will typically drop or glue their egg case into crevices, and those egg cases are a little bit smaller than those of the smoky brown cockroach, about 11 millimeters long. And like the smoky brown cockroaches, they have this sort of different look to them based on the age of the nymph. So those younger nymphs are going to have that very similar black coloration with white segments on the abdomen and at the base of the antennae. Unlike the smoky brown cockroaches, the older nymphs have a distinct mottled appearance. So they have a darker brown to black coloration, but with these lighter markings. In contrast to the smoky brown cockroaches, which are one solid color all the way down. So we'll talk about American cockroaches next, but these two look very, very similar. And so for me, the best way to distinguish between American and Australian cockroaches Technically, they have smaller body size that can be difficult to tell, especially if it's not a perfect specimen or if you don't have them side by side to compare them. They also have these little yellow bands on the upper margins of the forewings. Sometimes that can be difficult to see depending on that insect. But for me, the best way to tell is based on this darker, what I like to call a Batman symbol on their pronotum. So we have our this yellow background to the pronotum and a very, very clear, very distinct um, Batman outline. At least it looks like a Batman symbol to me. So finally, we have the American cockroach. These are about an inch and a half long, typically on the larger side of our peridomestic species. Outdoors, they're found in moist, shady areas, such as wood piles, in the hollows of trees, in mulch around the structure. And like all of the other species within this group, when they enter structures, it's in areas of high moisture. So oftentimes basements, crawl spaces, they're often associated with drains or sump pumps. And more broadly, they will be in um, sewers, boiler rooms, or steam heat tunnels. The egg case in American cockroaches tends to be brown, but will darken over time. And it's a little bit smaller than the egg cases of some of the other similar species. So it's only about eight millimeters long. The nymphs have this reddish brown color, um, but they have these darkened margins on the thoracic and abdominal segments. You can see these little dark black areas on the sides of the body. And American cockroaches can be distinguished from Australian cockroaches based on this larger body size, their lack of these yellow bands. And to me, the markings on the pronotum are a lot less distinct. They're a little bit more fuzzy um, than our Australian Batman symbol here. So jumping now into peridomestic cockroach control and Control is going to start with the inspection. So the goal of an inspection is to locate the problem and locate where the cockroaches might be coming in or where treatment can be applied. So it's important to be able to determine those conducive conditions. Tools like a flashlight and mirror can be very valuable for seeing into those difficult to see areas and determining the extent or location of cockroach infestations. 
Flushing agents can also be valuable for flushing cockroaches from harborages, although sometimes these can scatter and repel cockroaches into non-infested areas. So this possibility should be considered prior to the use of flushing agents, but they can be very good tools. And then also monitoring traps placed near the entrances to the structure, like a glue trap, can be valuable for assessing what cockroach you might be dealing with, as well as where it's coming in. Other inspection areas include under sidings, in the weep holes of brick openings, around pipes, uh, wires, cables, anything that's entering the structure where a hole has been drilled, around garbage cans and dumpsters. Not only are these providing warm, moist microclimates that a lot of these peri-domestic species love, but there's also very likely ample food resources for them there as well. Um, areas with high moisture issues that might be driving cockroaches inside, allowing them to, to be inside, as well as things like firewood or wood piles, especially ones that are pressed right up against the structure. Having an idea of where these conducive conditions are can help you figure out where those problems need to be addressed, as well as where treatment can be applied. We just went through a ton of identification of some peri-domestic species, and ID is absolutely critical to control. The most important question being, is it a domestic species or is it a peri-domestic species, as this is going to drive your management plan. Appearances can be tricky. I hope that this appearance, um, differences between an Australian and an American cockroach, is a little clearer for you after this presentation, but sometimes identifications can be nearly impossible. So if you're dealing with those first instar nymphs of a smoky brown or an Australian cockroach, this can be tough. So looking at different life stages can help to make that ID, but again, you're really wanting to make that ID between, is it a peri-domestic species coming from the outside or is it a domestic species that's established indoors? When it comes to treatment, it's critical to always take an integrated approach using all of the tools in your integrated pest management tool belt and then following the label appropriately. The biggest thing when it comes to peri-domestic species, because they're coming from the outside, inside, is exclusion. So checking outside for sources of infestation, eliminating those harborage sites, and then sealing any openings into the home can exclude these insects from entering. As we went over before, a lot of these peri-domestic species can be found under mulch, um, areas of high moisture, if the plants in this photo are getting watered a lot, it might be creating some really conducive conditions for things like smoky brown cockroaches, Australian cockroaches, to name a few. Again, these moisture issues can really be driving cockroach problems, especially when it comes to inside the structure, so plumbing leaks, um, any gutters that might be holding water and damp wood, not only is that a moisture concern, but that's decaying organic material that a lot of these species really like. And that can be facilitate, facilitating the entry of these outdoor species into the home. So spray-based uh, residual insecticides can be used in known harborage areas, preferably areas outdoors and away from human occupancy. While care needs to be taken around sensitive areas, such as around where children have access, for this reason, it's best to sort of apply them in a targeted area. There have been some issues with mixed efficacy of residual insecticides relating to pyrethroid resistance, um, but they can be, certainly be applied in certain circumstances. Um, one aspect that they can be used for is to treat a Webster and use it to apply the residual insecticide to the eaves of the home, as well as around porch lights where some of those species might be attracted to the light, landing on the structure and making their way inside. So dust can also be very effective when applied correctly. There are some locations that are better than others, but certainly using things like boric acid or silica gel in dry, inaccessible voids can be very valuable. 
when applying it to um, an area where the HVAC might be, so in basements, um, crawl spaces, or in the attic, it's important to make sure that that's turned off so that we don't have that movement of dust with the air intake or the air movement from motors. And additionally, dust can be used, um, applied to Webster poles and used to treat eaves on homes. So baits are a active ingredient. It's a toxic chemical inside of a food matrix that the cockroaches will consume and then succumb to the insecticide. Typically, the closer you can get to a harbored site, the better. So any voids on the outside of the building, um, firewood piles, tree holes, or landscaping can be really good places to treat with baits for our peri-domestic species. And Home stretch, as, as we said, domestic roaches and their control. So the first one I'll start with is the brown banded cockroach. Uh, these are going to be a lot smaller than our peri-domestic species. The adults are only going to be an inch and a half in length or less. They get their name from the dark bands um, that on the, you can see them on the male here at the bottom. And typically the males are going to have longer wings than females, but females tend to be a little bit more robust in body size, but their wings are only going to cover about a half to three quarters of their body length. Nymphs will have these two light colored bands on their body. And what's interesting about this species is that the females will carry that egg case for between a day to three days before she'll attach it to a surface. And some Studies in the lab have shown that they have a very strong preference for coarse surfaces that are hidden away. So things like the unfinished surfaces of wooden furniture, so underneath or in the back. And female brown banded cockroaches also have a preference for laying their eggs in proximity to other egg cases. Um, so you can get these kind of masses of dozens of egg cases. Unlike German cockroaches, brown banded cockroaches aren't tied to water within the home. And so they'll very readily disperse throughout the home. For this reason, they're kind of found in sort of oddball places. So the undersides of furniture, inside of bedrooms, behind picture frames on walls or on the upper kind of areas of walls. And they definitely have a preference, again, not for moisture, but for warm microhabitats. So I've heard of microwaves, for example, with pretty healthy numbers of brown banded cockroaches frequently crawling in and out. This is the big one. Um, German cockroaches, this is our number one pest species. They can only live indoors. The adults are a little bit bigger than brown banded cockroaches, but still only about a half inch long. They have a brown to dark brown coloration and they have these two distinct parallel bands along the length of their pronotum. So this is very key for German cockroaches, um, cockroaches indoors. There's a little bit of differences in appearance between German cockroaches, males and females. Typically the males have um, a narrower body while the females tend to be a little bit more robust. So what's very unique about German cockroaches is that the female will actually carry that egg case until it hatches or just before it hatches. So this can provide protection for the nymphs and ensure greater survival. So there's about 40 eggs per egg case, and that can go from no roaches to a lot of roaches in a home very, very quickly as they move through those, those nymphal instars. The nymphs have these light stripes down their back. In general, they're kind of a brown color, but they have a light and stripe down the back. And these, again, are the cockroach concern. They're the ones that give all cockroaches a really bad name. They are the most common domestic cockroach pests worldwide, all the way from the northern reaches of Canada, all the way down south to Patagonia. And they are completely reliant on us and our dwellings. They cannot survive outside, away from the water, food, harborage, and warmth that our homes provide them. 
So for indoor species, I'm going to focus on German cockroach control since that's going to be the predominant indoor pest. And these steps for control are very, very similar to what we talked about with the peri-domestic species. So inspection for indoor cockroaches is going to focus on the places where they're most likely to be. Indoors, that's areas like the kitchens, um, bathrooms, anywhere that food and water sources might be available. As well as outside of the kitchens and bathrooms, areas like door moldings, um, the hinges of kitchen cabinets, the corners inside the cabinets, and the sides of drawers are ideal harborages for, cockroach, for German cockroaches. When the population is low, it can be very difficult to find them with a visual inspection. And it can also be very difficult to find them with a visual inspection when it's there's a lot of clutter. So sticky traps are really, really valuable in these cases where there might be low populations or there might be difficulty doing a visual inspection. Um, these traps have glue on the bottom that helps to catch the roaches as they run through. Some sticky traps like these ones have an aggregation pheromone that uh, has the purpose of attracting roaches to the monitor. And these can also be placed in vulnerable areas like food storage or preparation areas or anywhere that a customer is saying that they're seeing roaches. Again, with treatment, it's important to take that integrated approach and use all of the tools in your toolbox. And as all of us, I'm sure, are aware, cockroach abundance is fairly closely associated to the sanitation conditions in the environment. So clutter is going to provide hiding spaces for the roaches and food debris providing nutrition. A lot of our insecticides that we're putting in, whether they be baits or residuals, are going to depend on the roaches coming in contact with them. And it can make it very difficult if, for example, they don't need to run because there's a lot of harborage or they don't need to eat anything else because there's a lot of food. This is definitely a challenging conversation to have with a customer and approaching um, with it with someone can be challenging. I think approaching them with your expertise and knowledge to help them understand what might need to be done to make your work more effective can be very valuable as well as giving them um, one task at a time, let's say taking out the trash or removing potential food sources as something that can increase the efficacy of what it is that you're doing. Physical and mechanical control is phenomenal. So using something like a vacuum cleaner, especially with a HEPA filter, you can remove cockroaches from the environment as well as dead cockroaches, that fecal material, those cast skins that all might be contributing allergens into that home. Any cockroaches that are sucked up in a vacuum are that many less that need to be controlled through other measures. And it's also a very obvious treatment. A customer can hear you vacuuming, they can see you vacuuming, and you end up with a bag or a vacuum canister full of roaches that you can show the customer that you are removing from the home. Exclusion looks a little bit different for our indoor species, but this is primarily looking at sealing those cracks and crevices along countertops, baseboards, just to reduce those harborages. A lot of times, particularly in apartments, those cabinets don't have anything behind them. And so they're the perfect safe place for cockroaches to aggregate. So trying to prevent access to those areas is a really great strategy. Again, on residual insecticides, they can provide effective control. However, there is now some maybe more mixed efficacy related to pyrethroid resistance, um, but they can be used to target harborage sites where the roaches are. Dust can also be very effective when applied into cracks and crevices, so it's important that this can be applied correctly. In this instance, uh, in this photo, it's probably a little bit overkill. Um, certainly some locations are better than others, but those cracks and crevices, inaccessible voids that are dry can be a great place for applying dusts. And with baits, um, applying those, again, close to harborage sites, in cracks and crevices, 
The closer you can get to a harborage site, the better, because the cockroaches aren't going to need to travel as far in order to come in contact with the bait. They're going to be a lot more likely to eat your bait than something else. And these are great for sensitive areas. They have long lasting residual impacts, and they also have that ability for secondary kill. So we talked about how um, nymphs practice coprophagy. Um, that active ingredient will still be in the feces of that cockroach, those adult cockroaches before they die. And the nymphs can consume that and be impacted by that active ingredient. With baits, it's very important to switch to not only different products, but also different modes of action, different active ingredients that are operating different ways every time you apply baits in the same location. This helps to prevent the development of bait aversion or resistance, and it also accounts for food preferences or resistance that might be present in that population. Especially if you haven't, if that's a new account that you've picked up, you don't necessarily know what's been applied or what um, those roaches have been exposed to. So this can be a very good strategy for making sure that baits are effective. And then education. So not only you attending a conference or training or webinar, but also you being the educator, educating the customers, talking to them and explaining why you're doing what you're doing, establishing yourself as an expert and making sure that they are able to have that trust in you can be incredibly valuable. And then finally, follow-ups. Once a treatment is put in, continual monitoring, assessing of that treatment, making sure it's working is really important. And this is somewhere where those monitoring traps can be really helpful as they can provide information if there's a decline in cockroaches or if you maybe need to change up treatment strategies. So in conclusion, knowing the identification, biology and habits of these pests that we're trying to manage is absolutely critical. And when you can take those into account, it helps you to pick the best management strategies. You can also take this information and share it with customers. Let them know why you're doing things the way you are, that you've made these treatment choices from an educated standpoint and demonstrating that you are the true professional. And the last thing I'll, I'll uh, pitch for is always following the label. And with that, I thank you so much for your time on this Friday morning. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jonalyn. Thank you all for attending. Uh, hope everyone has a great start to their weekend. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, bye.